Hey, everybody. Introduce myself, Stephen Little. Uh, pleasure to be here. Um, Dr. Shaw and I are presenting to you the mixed heart valve disease uh, session for uh, multimodality imaging. Um, I'll take on the upper role. Dr. Shaw will talk about the uh, role of MRI. All right. So the, uh, the goal is here. Uh, demonstrate the concepts of total pressure and volume loading in the setting of mixed valve dis uh, dysfunction, uh, and then re uh, to review some of the common presentations of multivalve dysfunction. So mixed valve disease is, is really a big topic, um, and there's different ways to conceptually sort of organize your thinking around this. Um, one role is to think about um, one valve that has two relatively independent pathologies. So that's sort of one bad guy thinking. The other challenge is two bad guys. So that's uh, aortic stenosis combined with MR or AS with MS or AR with MR or MR with TR. So those sort of six combinations are the common phenotypes that we would see clinically. All right. So here's an example of kind of two bad guys. So this is a 91-year-old who presented with a, a dyspnea. He had a history of remote cabbage. Um, from the 2D images, you see a couple of bad things. You see a mitral valve that doesn't close and an aortic valve that doesn't open. That's a bad combination. Uh, it, uh, see, it's a pretty picture in 3D. It's not new information, um, but it tells you you've got uh, double valve disease that is significant. And this is fairly easy because both elements of this dysfunction look significant. Uh, this is a, based on age primarily. He's a prohibitive operative risk. Uh, and is the treatment have priority aortic stenosis or mitral regurgitation or both simultaneously. So for tough decisions, we look for guidance. Um, we have some guidance, uh, and it's, uh, it's really evolving. So if we look back at the 2014 ACC AHA valve guidelines, there was a one-page discussion of, mitral valve, uh, of mixed valve disease. There were only four references, so it was a very short conversation uh, on a background of over a 100-page document. Uh, the update in 2017 to the guidelines uh, really offered no new information on uh, mixed valve disorders. Uh, but thankfully, the uh, 2020 uh, basically rewrite of the guidelines did address this more formally. So now we have three pages uh, of the more current guidelines. There is a consensus that in patients with ambiguous symptoms uh, that might be attributable to, attributable to mixed valve disorder, um, sort of look for other things. Um, so the message here in the mixed valve disease guideline is really to consider the combined pressure and volume load some of those things uh, don't fall within our, our predefined concepts of quantitation uh, for a single disorder. So that's why the, the guideline really sort of gets into the discussion of these might be the scenarios where you use uh, invasive markers or biomarkers uh, to help understand the ventricular or chamber challenges. Um, also in the uh, interventions for mixed disorder, there is a discussion around, for example, uh, combined uh, aortic stenosis with aortic regurgitation, uh, the, you know, it may not meet all of the criteria for severity in one or the other, but when you see a ventricle that's starting to suffer, you can assume that this is a hemodynamically important combined lesion that's probably worthy of an intervention. So look for evidence of adverse remodeling or dysfunction. And that's probably the two most important messages from the three pages in the guidelines on mixed disorder. Consider the combined pressure and volume and spend extra time looking for subtle uh, evidence of adverse uh, function or remodeling. So we'll look at some specific multivalve um, uh, concepts. So aortic stenosis plus. So these are the sort of standard pattern of aortic stenosis. This graphic it shows the normal ventricle, normal ventricle size. Uh, and this is your high flow, high gradient aortic stenosis. This is the relatively easy one. Then you've got your paradoxical low flow. So the paradox is that your EF is normal, but you're still low flow. This generally means a, a thick hypertrophied ventricle with relatively small stroke volume, or occasionally just a small person with a stroke volume that's smaller than we expect. That's where the stroke volume index comes into play. Uh, so that your paradoxical low flow, low gradient. And then this one is the classic low flow, low gradient. Usually it's a big baggy ventricle with a depressed EF and your forward flow is diminished. And therefore the standard quantitation of AS based on either peak velocity or mean gradient um, doesn't quite hit thresholds because those are both flow dependent measures. So the idea of mixed uh, valve is sort of thinking about, of course, that what's causing or, or stealing flow upstream of the valve. So in these low flow scenarios, it's not just a depressed EF that we have to consider. This is where mixed valve uh, disorders sort of have a conceptual 
uh, role. There's a this is a sort of a slide that's been out for a while of all the different things that can might be contributing to a low flow state. Um, so impaired diastolic filling, a small intrinsic LV we talked about, but one of the important ones for this talk is mitral regurgitation. And this has also been referred to as lost flow because the flow is going backward instead of forward across the valve that you're trying to quantify. Uh, mitral stenosis, I would argue with, is not truly a low flow state, it's a high pressure state, uh, but tricuspid regurgitation is a low flow because it's got a preload of the left ventricle coming from the right. So significant TR can be a low flow state in your aortic stenosis conversation. So the combination of severe TR with AS is a significant double valve disorder that you have to be considering the impact of the TR on your AS quantitation. So we'll look at some specifics. Uh, here's a case of a 75 year old with aortic stenosis and uh, significant heart failure symptoms. At a baseline, we see some Doppler uh, on the right. His stroke volume is 40 mils. His mean gradient is 46. His calculated valve area by continuity equation is 0.4. So what is this in terms of an AS severity? Well, this is low flow normal gradient AS. This is bad AS. This is the worst AS. But he still and manages to maintain high, high gradient uh, with a bad ventricle. So that's a fairly easy diagnostic challenge. This is a different one. This has a depressed ventricle. Stroke volume uh, is a little bit depressed. Peak velocity is 2.7. The mean gradient is only 16, and the calculated valve area is 0.94, so just below our severe threshold. So what's this aortic stenosis? Well, this is the scenario where augmenting the forward flow would be potentially useful if we could do it. So this is the uh, dobutamine. So now we have augmented flow. So basically by uh, doing a dobutamine stress echo, we've uh, asked the ventricle to put a little more flow across the aortic valve and see if the aortic valve opens a bit more when it's asked to do so with more flow. And in that scenario, the valve area goes from 0.94 to 1.4. Uh, the, the grading goes up a little bit, but more importantly, the area goes up significantly. So this is not severe aortic stenosis. This is low flow, low gradient, non-severe AS, uh, as revealed by dobutamine. Different case, severe aortic stenosis is the question. This is a depressed ventricle again. Here's the resting Doppler uh, with a stroke volume of 45 and a valve area of 0.7. Mean gradient is only 18. Uh, with dobutamine and flow augmentation, the mean gradient goes up to 40. The valve area stays roughly the same, uh, and, but the stroke volume goes up. So this is, reveals low flow, low gradient, true severe aortic stenosis. So showing you these cases to emphasize that the flow upstream of the valve matters very much. And this is relevant to the concept of mixed valve disorders as well. So aortic stenosis with aortic regurgitation um, simple teaching, and you see this on the sort of sawtooth uh, Doppler shown here. If the, you have a high gradient with a large valve area, in this example 1.2, then that's probably uh, aortic regurgitation is the more dominant of the two lesions that coexist within this valve. If there's a high gradient and a small calculated aortic valve, as in the bottom example, the valve area 0.8, then probably aortic stenosis is the more dominant of the two lesions. Sometimes the fellows will ask, why do we have so many different measures for aortic stenosis? Mean gradient, peak velocity, valve area, DVI. Well, this is an example of why this is useful. So here the aortic valve area is clearly added value in trying to determine uh, aortic regurgitation dominance from aortic stenosis dominance. Different case, I hope you, this projects reasonably well. This is a short axis view of the LV at the level of the mitral valve. Uh, if we were interacting uh, a, little a little little more live, I would ask if this looks normal. And if, if you look at the anterior mitral leaflet, which is right here, uh, and you look at how it's opening, um, I, I would uh, suggest that it's not normal. So what's going on here? Well, this gentleman, Dr. Austin Flint, described this about 150 years ago. So here's what's happening. In this apical five-chamber view, look at the anterior mitral valve. You don't even necessarily need the color Doppler to know what's going on. The mitral valve is not opening in diastole. It's restricted. Although it's thin, it looks pliable. It doesn't clearly look rheumatic. It doesn't look calcific. Why is the anterior mitral leaflet not opening? It's because there's a large jet of aortic regurgitation, in this case, impinging on the anterior mitral leaflet, creating a diastolic rumble that you hear with your stethoscope. So this is the Austin Flint murmur, and kind of amazing that he described it 150 years ago before we had echo, and certainly before we were tilting protons with MRI. All right, so this is what that would look like. 
uh, on a transthoracic. You see the anterior mitral valve leaflet not opening. And just to confirm, there's the AI jet. So this is a mixed valve disorder causing sort of a pseudo mitral stenosis, at least in terms of auscultation. It's often not a hemodynamically significant mitral stenosis. You're not going to get gradients of six or seven or eight, but you'll get small diastolic gradients uh, enough to at least to cause some turbulence uh, and something that you'll hear. So let's look at aortic stenosis and mitral regurgitation. And this was the other case, of sort of the fourth case of significant AS that I was going to show. I showed you three already, some with dibutamine. This is a, an elderly female with remote cabbage. Now with dyspnea, you can see she's got fairly significant mitral regurgitation. There's a, a, a colored Doppler jet that's fairly impressive. There is a CW that looks fairly impressive. There's a very tall E wave. So we're all thinking this is significant MR. Um, and, but she's also got, on a little more review of the echo, uh, aortic valve dis disease. So she's got calcified leaflets that don't open. She's got a CW wave of only three meters. This is that scenario of lost flow severe aortic stenosis. You really can't do a debutamine stress echo here. You'll just uh, augment the MR uh, and probably make her feel much worse. So it's just likely to be a non-diagnostic study. So in these days, we'll often go to CT, look at the independent calcium score. If the calcium score of the valve is over 1,200, that's usually consistent with significant uh, aortic stenosis. So she would be a significant AS with significant MR. So severe AS can be underestimated uh, with MR. So as the MR gets worse, you have a lower systemic stroke volume that results in even lower aortic valve pressure gradients. And this gets further amplified in patients who have significant uh, LV depression. What about MR and MS? So you have to think about what's happening with MR, particularly to the left atrium. So this is the normal scenario. You've got an LA pressure of 10. You've got a normal LV size and volumes and a normal forward stroke volume. You have some event, maybe a papillary muscle rupture or, or probably more simply a chordal rupture. You have a significant uh, acute uh, MR, 70 mils is shown in the, uh, the graphic and a reduced forward stroke volume. Your LA pressure goes up over time your LA dilates, the pressure goes down, the forward stroke volume sort of compensates a little bit. The MR may also go up as your LV gets larger. Uh, and then over time you come, become chronically compensated and your LA pressure comes back, to, or may go up a little bit, but the LA volume, which isn't really well shown in this graphic, gets larger and larger, which we're all familiar with. In general, we try to intervene somewhere here before you become decompensated. But in the echo lab, you'll see some fairly incredible LA volume increases. So on the left is somebody who has perhaps MR, there's an LA volume of 114 mils, uh, maybe diastolic dysfunction, perhaps even atrial fibrillation, um, liver disorders, and, and renal disorders. But when you get the LA that is 400 mils, that's almost always the combination of MS and MR. Uh, and at that point, usually with atrial fibrillation. So these gigantic atria are a great example of the combined effect of both pressure and volume. Um, and they can do incredible things to chambers. So this is a different case. Um, this is a retired physician. He's got a fairly ugly valve, just sort of highlighting two things. There's a concept that you can have mixed disorders even in, within one specific pathology. So in the Carpentier classification of valvular heart disease, um, it's a little complicated. It's often shown with little graphics to remind everybody of what it is. But it generally talks about, you know, it's a, a way to sort of subdivide primary and secondary MR, uh, prim uh, functional MR. Uh, and in this case, you have a restriction of leaflets in both systole and diastole and some acquired degeneration. So this fairly ugly valve has a whole host of shared pathologies uh, creating MR. Um, this is that patient before an intervention. This is the patient after a single mitral clip is deployed. The valve starts ugly, it ends ugly, it doesn't look good at all. However, we look at the effect. So the pulmonary veins have S wave reversal at baseline, and then after the deployment of a single mitral clip, the S wave is upright. This to emphasize that it's the pulmonary veins uh, that really dictate how the patient's going to feel and how the patient's going to do and what's happening with the sort of a visual aesthetic of the valve is less important than what's happening within the pulmonary veins. So MR and TR is one of the last uh, sort of combined valve disorders I'll, I'll, I'll show you. Um, and the important thing about MR and TR, and thankfully they're separated by a septum, 
is that they might be independent, they might be related, but the quantification of each of the disorders is independent. So whether there's MR or TR or they coexist, you approach each lesion, each lesion separately in terms of the quantification, uh, and, but the treatment uh, may uh, be related to what you do to one may affect the other. Notably, what you do to the mitral valve may occasionally uh, impact what happens to the tricuspid valve. Certainly on the surgical perspective, that's the, that's the teaching. So, uh, in summary, mixed valve disease. If you look at aortic stenosis and aortic regurgitation, you must be considering the volume and the pressure load. If you look at aortic stenosis and mitral regurgitation, the AS can be tough to quantify. Uh, recognize that the MR is augmented by high LV pressure, uh, and that it can be challenging sometimes to evaluate which is your treatment priority. Usually, it's the aortic valve, but occasionally it's the mitral valve first. Uh, the combination of MR and MS uh, often coexists, leading to a very large LA volume with, because of the combined pressure load. And then finally for MR and TR, um, they may be independent um, pathologies, uh, sort of via atrial fibrillation or a dilated cardiomyopathy, or they may be related with mitral regurgitation leading to pulmonary hypertension and then secondary TR. Uh, and the treatment synergies, if one treats both, are sort of being evaluated, particularly in the transcatheter era now. So remember that perspective matters. This is an old cartoon. The guy on the island is, is so happy that he sees a boat. The guy on the boat is so happy that he sees land. Um, so the perspective of the chamber, of the pulmonary veins, these are the things that as a clinician we're trying to evaluate um, to come up with a solution for the patient. So what is the ventricle seeing, extra volume, extra pressure, or both? Uh, what are the pulmonary veins seeing? Uh, do you have a dominant S wave or not? And that's the example, a similar example to what I showed. So I'll wrap up the echo component and we'll turn things over to Dr. Shaw uh, right. to show us the MRI. Okay, wonderful. Uh, and just a quick uh, comment also for the folks uh, that are tuning in uh, from uh, uh, live stream, uh, that you can uh, go to pollev.com if you have any questions. Uh, enter the, the keyword debakey and then ask your question or uh, you can text uh, the word DeBakey to 37607 uh, and ask your question there. So let me get on now to the role of uh, cardiac MRI in assessment of mixed valvular heart disease. So let's go ahead and let's get right to a case here. This is a 77-year-old gentleman who has a, a history of hypertension, hyperlipidemia, COPD, AFib on Eliquis. This is kind of the classic Steve Little valve clinic patient that he sends and you know, calls me 10 minutes after the study is done. Can I get the results, please? Uh, so this is a patient that's being evaluated for mitral clip. So what do we notice? Obviously, just, just on this three-chamber view already, I can see there is a significant signal void here uh, during systole in the left atrium. But notice there's also a diastolic uh, jet uh, across the aortic valve as well. So there's coexisting uh, MR as well as AI. And so this is kind of our final results as far as what we uh, assessed in this patient, which is that there's both severe AR as well as severe MR, as well as all the LV and RV uh, uh, remodeling. But let me kind of walk you through how we go about and do this. Um, and I think the first thing I want to do is just a little bit of a recap of how we approach isolated valve regurgitant lesions as well as isolated stenotic lesions. Uh, and then uh, really the things that we're looking at is severity as well as consequences. And then we'll talk about uh, how we do mixed valve lesions, where again, we're looking at the pathophysiologic effects. Also, I will highlight some of the imaging caveats as well as imaging pitfalls, and then uh, talk about kind of the general approach to mixed valve lesions. Um, so many recaps. So let's, and, and this is really what we touched on the last few weeks. Uh, I think Dr. Nabi talked about stenotic lesions and I talked about, or Carlos talked about uh, valvular uh, isolated lesions by CMR. So let's just kind of recap. So one is for the aortic valve. Uh, there's a few different ways that you quantify isolated aortic regurgitation. Uh, the preferred or kind of the generally des de described method is where you actually do a phase contrast in the aortic route beyond or just distal to the aortic valve location, as you can see here, where this will allow you to measure the anterograde flow as well as the direct diastolic retrograde flow. But then in addition to that, there's also other methodologies that we can utilize. One is to look at the LVOT forward flow 
compared to the net pulmonary artery flow, or you can simply compare the LV stroke volume to the RV stroke volume. Now, what I'm going to do is point out in the setting of mixed lesions, some of these will have some caveats or issues with them, but this is kind of for isolated lesions, all of these methodologies should work. Now, also we talked, I think, um, before about some kind of semi-qualitative methods that you can use, one of which is if you just look at the size of the regurgitant orifice area in aortic regurgitation, there's uh, several studies that have shown that an ARO uh, can give you with fairly good sensitivity and specificity for determining that there's 3 plus aortic regurgitation. And the cutoff here that's uh, been utilized is 0.28 centimeters squared. Uh, for, uh, also, you can look at the uh, holodiastolic flow reversal in the descending aorta, and in this particular study, and again, these are all isolated valve lesion cases, uh, a holodiastolic flow reversal of more than 10 cc's per second uh, was associated with a high likelihood of having 3 or 4 plus aortic regurgitation. Uh, for isolated mitral valve lesions, we, we talked about the fact that we use a, what's called an indirect method where we compare the LV stroke volume that we, that we determine by planimetry of the uh, cine images to the flow going out the LVOT or the aorta that we determine by phase contrast. And then again, for the mitral regurgitation in isolated lesions, you could also compare the LV stroke volume to the net pulmonary artery stroke volume or, as a last resort, compare the LV to the RV stroke volume. Um, and it, as well for the mitral valve, there are some other criteria that we can look at. Uh, this here is looking at the anatomic regurgent orifice area. And for the mitral valve, uh, this study suggests that an ARO of more than 0.4 centimeters squared had a fairly high sensitivity and specificity for uh, sellers grade 3 or 4 uh, mitral regurgitation. And then last recap was for the aortic valve for aortic stenosis, where we're actually going to try to independently measure what the velocity and the gradient is across the valve using phase contrast, as is shown here, uh, as well as try to separately measure what the anatomic uh, orifice area is of the aortic valve during peak systole, as is shown in this methodology here. So these are two methods that are independent of each other. Uh, they're not relying on each other to, to uh, compute an assessment of aortic stenosis. And then, um, what do we do with mixed valve disease? I think there's a couple of key principles that I want to go over. One is, the, the goal really is to try to solve for flow in as many chambers as you can. And that's really going to be one of the key hallmarks when you approach multivalve disease. The other thing I think also let's, let's recognize is some of the basic principles, which is in the absence of any regurgitation, your LV stroke volume should equal your RV stroke volume, should equal your aortic flow, uh, should equal your pulmonary artery flow. So there should be basically symmetry or concordance of flow going through all of these chambers. Now, the other thing also to recognize is if there is valvular regurgitation, then what you measure as either the aortic forward flow or the LVOT forward flow is really the sum of what the systemic flow is plus what the aortic regurgitation is. The pulmonary artery forward flow really represents the sum of the systemic flow plus the pulmonary regurgitant flow. The LV stroke volume is actually comprised of three components. It's the systemic flow, any aortic regurgitation, as well as any mitral regurgitation. And then the RV stroke volume is really composed of the systemic flow, the pulmonic regurgitation, and the tricuspid regurgitation. And so I would say that it's really understanding, you know, kind of these basic physiologic concepts will then help us when we go and approach patients who have multiple valve lesions. But again, I think it's, it's these things. So when, when I measure the pulmonary artery forward flow, what I measure there is really the, the sum of whatever pulmonic regurgitation there is plus the systemic flow. And so for all of these different uh, uh, chambers, knowing what these values represent, what the individual components of them are, will help you then solve for the individual valve lesions. So let's go back now to the first case that I started off with, this case uh, of mixed mitral uh, and aortic regurgitation. 
and, and go through how we're going to approach uh, uh, trying to determine severity. So in this case, what I would do is uh, try to go after the aortic regurgitant severity first. Uh, and the uh, ideal way to do that here would be to just simply measure the phase contrast uh, in the aortic root just above the aortic valve level. And again, notice this measure right here is going to be independent of if there's any mitral regurgitation or if there's any right-sided valve lesions. And in this case, you'll notice what we measure is actually that the re direct reverse flow here uh, is 70 cc's. And if I compare that to the forward flow coming across the aortic valve uh, or across the LVOT, which we measured at 127, then I get an aortic regurgitant fraction of 55%. So that already tells me we're dealing with severe AI. Now I'm going to go next and try to solve what's the severity of the mitral regurgitation. And actually, before I do that, one other thing that we oftentimes will do in these cases of mixed valve disease is try to look for multiple confirmatory checks. So I, you know, so I did here a direct aortic regurgitant uh, measure, but remember I also mentioned that I could also look at the LVOT forward flow and compare that to the net PA flow, because that should also be equivalent to what my aortic regurgitation is. And so in this patient, that's exactly what we did as well, is I measure the flow in the pulmonary artery, and I have here the anterograde flow, as well as the retrograde flow in the pulmonary artery, and I have a net PA flow of 49 cc's. So if 127 is going forward across the LVOT, and I know that my net PA flow is 49 cc's, that difference comes out to 78. So that's fairly close to the 70 mLs that I got uh, when I just did a direct uh, aortic regurgitation measurement from the aortic root. And the one area where this method on the right-hand side of comparing the LVOT forward flow to the PA flow is useful is in the setting if you've got somebody who's got either PVCs or if they're in atrial fibrillation where your diastolic period may be variable, in those cases oftentimes uh, we'll rely on this measure because again here I'm measuring systolic forward flow in the LVOT and comparing that to the forward flow uh, or the net flow in the pulmonary artery so it's less uh, affected by uh, variability in the diastolic filling period as in AFib whereas trying to measure a direct aortic re reverse flow uh, may be a little bit more challenging in that setting. Now, uh, in this particular patient, the other thing that I did also, another confirmatory check, was I actually looked at the uh, cine images that I have at the aortic valve level, um, and, and I could actually measure the anatomic regurgent orifice area of this aortic regurgitation, which I got 0.41, which again, that is also consistent with significant AI. So I've got really kind of three different uh, methodologies which are all kind of con concordant with each other saying I'm dealing with severe aortic regurgitation. Next then we'll turn to the mitral valve uh, and determine what's the severity of the mitral regurgitation and so here I'm going to just do this, the same kind of garden variety formula that we do for mitral regurgitation which is what is the LV stroke volume minus what is the uh, LVOT forward flow and in this case, again, from, from our cine images that we have, we able, we're able to determine that the LV and diastolic was 383 and systolic was 191. Therefore, the LV stroke volume was 192 mLs. And if I then compare that to the forward flow across the LVOT, because again, remember, whatever the LV is ejecting out, some of it is basically forward flow that's going across the aortic valve and some of it's flow that's going backward across the mitral valve. And therefore, that difference then, the 192 minus the 27, represents my mitral regurgitation, which is 65 cc's, which again would be consistent with severe MR. And then one other thing here now is uh, to determine the mitral regurgitant fraction, the way that, that I prefer to do this is to actually look at the mitral regurgitant volume divided by what is the forward flow coming across the mitral valve, which again is effectively the systemic flow plus the mitral regurg, uh, and I use that to then determine what the mitral regurgent fraction is. Uh, so essentially subtracting out the AI, uh, and this gives us a 53% uh, mitral regurgent fraction. Now, um, and, and so this again takes us back to our final interpretation for this case, severe AI severe MR with specific uh, quantitative numbers for both AI severity and fraction and MR severity and fraction, as well as uh, markers of LV remodeling uh, and RV remodeling. Now, um, let me skip forward here. 
So to kind of summate, what did I do here in the setting of mixed mitral and aortic regurgitation? Um, what I'm really trying to do here is determine um, that the uh, aortic regurgitation by really the standard methodology, which is just to measure the direct reverse flow. The aortic regurgent fraction is basically, again, done by the standard methodology of the aortic regurgent volume divided by the LVOT forward flow. The mitral regurgitation in this case is done by the standard method that we do for isolated mitral valves, which is, again, LV stroke volume minus LVOT forward flow. But where there's a little bit of a difference is for mitral regurgent fraction, I'll take the mitral regurgent volume and divide it by the LV stroke volume minus the aortic flow, because that really represents what is the forward flow going across the mitral valve. A uh, couple other things to keep in mind um, is that th th this methodology right here that I talked to you about for mixed uh, MRAS is not going to be impacted by any right-sided valve lesion. So there's no, uh, uh, p there's no pitfalls or, or caveats that you need to be aware of uh, if there's coexisting TR or coexisting PI. Um, and then as I talked about earlier, uh, in the setting of AFib, where your direct aortic reverse flow may be challenging, in those cases, you may prefer to calculate your aortic regurgitation by comparing the LVOT forward flow to the pulmonary artery net flow. Um, and then as a last resort, what if something happens and, and none of my phase contrast imaging is reliable, or the study got aborted before I was able to do any phase contrast imaging? Well, then I could simply compare the LV to RV stroke volumes, and as long as there's not any right-sided regurgitation, what that tells me is that if the LV stroke volume is 192, but the RV stroke volume is, is 60, then it tells me that the combined left-sided regurgent load is 132 mLs. Um, so again, that piece of information can be useful, although you can't necessarily isolate out which is MR, which is uh, uh, AR, it can at least be useful in, in quantifying what the total load is on the left ventricle. Now let's move on to another case, and this is a case where you can see on the echo there's significant mitral regurgitation, or significant color jet at least, um, but if you look at the aortic valve, you can see that the aortic valve also looks like it has some reduced opening, uh, and there is an increased uh, aortic valve forward flow velocities. So here's the MRI for this patient, and again, just from showing you the street chamber view, you can see again, there is uh, flow acceleration at the aortic valve level. The valve doesn't seem to be opening normally, and we can see there is some MR. So let's go through and try to solve uh, for both the AS severity as well as the MR severity in this case. So two things we did. One, we actually went through and, and perimetered what is the anatomic orifice area of this aortic valve. And during peak systole, we got a valve area of one centimeter, so kind of in the moderate to severe range. Um, and then when we measure by phase contrast what the velocity across this aortic valve is, we're getting about 3.5 meters per second. Um, so next, let's look at the MR quantification. Now. Notice, you know, generally speaking for MR, you'll look at the LV stroke volume and compare that to the flow coming out the ascending aorta. In this case, though, when you've got a stenotic aortic valve, look what happens to the flow. You get turbulent and defaced flow beyond the stenotic valve. So measuring flow at the ascending aorta could be problematic. It may underestimate the flow. And so instead, you're better off measuring the flow in the left ventricular outflow tract. So what I'll do is actually look at the forward flow across the LVOT, which in this case was 80 cc's, compare that to the LV stroke volume by planimetry, which in this case I got 100 cc's, which gives me only about 20 cc's of mitral regurgitation. So again, it looks like uh, the AS is moderate to severe, but the MR looks like in this case is probably only just mild. And one of the things that, um, or let me just go through and talk about how when you have mixed AS and MR, how you approach it. So for your MR quantification, I think that the big uh, caveat here is compare your LV stroke volume not to the flow in the ascending aorta, but rather flow uh, that's coming across, that's measured at the LVOT. Or if there's some problem with the LVOT flow, you could try to compare it to the pulmonary artery net flow, uh, again, provided that there's not any uh, significant pulmonic regurgitation. Um, the other thing for calculating the mitral regurgent fraction in the setting of mixed AS and MR, use basically the same methodology that you use for isolated mitral valve lesions. And then we talked about uh, for the AS uh, in the setting of mixed lesions like this, you would use a standard method for AS velocity that we use, 
as well as the standard method that we use for aortic valve area. So nothing changes there. And then I think as, as Dr. Little nicely touched on, when you have mixed AS and MR, that can obviously lead to, uh, I think on, on color Doppler, um, you know, a more prominent uh, uh, jet, uh, despite the fact that the severity of the, uh, of the mitral regards may not be as great. Um, let's finish off with one last case, um, and then we'll have some time hopefully for some questions. Um, so here we've got a patient who has, um, you know, what looks like, um, you know, uh, mitral regurg. Looks like there's also some tricuspid regurg. And it also looks like there's some aortic stenosis here. We can see flow turbulence at the aortic valve level. So we've got really here a case, uh, and then also there's aortic regurgitation. So we've got kind of multiple valve lesions here, but again, it looks like the predominant lesions here is gonna be a combination of AS plus MR. So let me go through and, and talk about how you would do this. So I think for a case like this, the first thing I would do is try to tackle the AS. Um, and so I would say, let's look at what the anatomic orifice area is uh, across the aortic valve, again, based on our cine images, uh, and also compare what is our peak velocity. So in this case, we're getting a peak velocity of 4.75 meters per second, and a directly planimetered anatomic valve area of uh, one centimeter per second. So this, again, would be consistent with, with pretty significant aortic stenosis. Uh, but then let's also look at the, the uh, aortic regurgitation quantification. And the way that we would approach this uh, would be, again, not to try to measure the flow beyond the stenotic valve, because that could be turbulent flow, but rather to measure the flow proximal to the valve. So I'll measure the LVOT forward flow in systole which in this case is 105 cc's, and then I'll compare that to what the pulmonary artery net flow is, which in this case we measured 53 mLs, so we're getting a, or 52 mL, sorry, so we're getting a, a aortic regurgitation of 53 cc's and an aortic regurgitation fraction of 50%. Um, so again, when you have mixed AS as well as AR, the way that you calculate the aortic regurgitation is really to go with the LVOT forward flow minus the pulmonary artery net flow, for regurgent fraction, it's going to be basically just the aortic regurgent volume divided by the LVOT forward flow. For uh, aortic valve velocity and gradients, uh, you would use the same methodology that we use for isolated uh, um, uh, aortic stenosis. And then obviously, as we know, aortic valve velocities and gradients can be flow dependent. So again, I'm going to wrap up here so we have some time for questions. So I think that the key thing, kind of the key takeaways, is if we're approaching mixed valve disease by MRI, you want to try to solve for as many chambers as you can. So solve for flow in as many chambers as you can. And then um, in addition to that, I think you want to try to systematically work through the equations that I talked about and recognize, again, that when you look at the LV stroke volume or the RV stroke volume, the components of that really are the systemic flow plus the uh, semilunar valve regurgitation, which is aortic or, or pulmonic, as well as the AV valve regurgitation, which is the, the mitral or the tricuspid, uh, versus if you look at the forward flow going out the LVOT or forward flow going out the pulmonary artery, that is basically composed of the systemic flow plus the regurgent flow across that semilunar valve. So as long as you know those basic physiologic principles, you can typically work through these uh, as long as you've tried to calculate as many different chambers as you can. And I think I'll leave it with the last slide, which I think Steve touched on as well, which is if you look at the, the current valve guidelines, you know, between the ACC as well as the, uh, here the ASC documents, uh, they're very extensive. But yet the, the amount of, of space uh, uh, for multivalve disease is very limited. And the reason for that is because really there's not a lot of research that's been done. And so I think for fellows that are out there looking for research projects, I think there's lots of great opportunities to uh, make a name for yourself, but also I think help us uh, in the cardiology community better manage our patients. So with that, I thank you for your attention and uh, hopefully we'll have some time for some questions. Uh, if there's any questions from uh, folks that are uh, tuning in uh, via the web, again, just go to pollev.com, enter the keyword DeBakey, or you can text your question by going to 37607 and uh, entering the word DeBakey. Anybody here at Houston Methodist, if you're on Zoom, we'd be glad to 
unmute yourself and uh, uh, take a question also. Yes, hi. So for the uh, anatomical um, uh, regurgitant area, that comparing to the echo, usually the one on the uh, MRI will be uh, will be smaller, right? You're talking about anatomic regurgitant orifice area? Correct. The arrow. I'm not sure that there's a lot of uh, direct comparison done to ARO by echo because I'm not sure that on transthoracic echo you typically don't do a anatomic regurgent orifice area, right? So there's really not any much data that I'm aware of. Most of the comparisons have been to actually what the hemodynamic load is, right? So they've been compared to either Sellers or echo or MRI graded severity of regurgitation. I mean, right. I mean, like that comparing to the uh, ERO on the echo. Sorry, that's, that's what I mean. I mean, like the anatomical uh, orifice area on the MRI compared to the effective orifice area on the echo. For like the... Uh, so you're talking about for yeah, mitral regurgitation or ear regurgitation? So you raise a good question, though. So it's important to emphasize that they are different. They are different things. Right, an anatomic area whether defined by MRI or CT or even rarely by a good uh, TE is a different uh, number uh, typically than the EOA, EROA for regurgitant lesion. Um, and some would say that the difference is greater for the higher velocity defect. So for mitral regurgitation, if you do an anatomic area, it's a time point, right? You don't know which time point, presumably when it's at its biggest, which may not be for the entire systolic phase. That's an anatomic area. Uh, and the EROA, as defined by, by ECHO, um, there is flow convergence and contraction. That's the whole concept of the vena contracta. So the, the, the flow actually contracts a little bit going through that hole. So even if all your measures were perfect, even just from a hydrodynamic principle, the EROA is usually a tiny bit smaller than the anatomic area for the high velocity jet. So that's the mitral scenario. The aortic scenario, uh, you know, the velocities are lower um, and the gradients uh, are different. So in theory, the difference between an aortic regurgitant uh, a Doppler defined and a uh, anatomically measured area would be different, but I mean these are these are concepts. Um, it's very difficult when you change uh, modalities. Um, but I think just to recognize that they shouldn't be off by huge amounts, right? So if the anatomic if the anatomic area is one, and the Doppler is 0.9, you know that's basically the same thing um, from a clinical perspective. But I think, you know, I, mean, I want to stress for the MRI, though, where, I mean, again, those, you know, the, the anatomic regurgitant orifice area that we're using is kind of a last line resort, right? And again, it's just an idea to give you a uh, assessment of the kind of overall severity, but the, the preferred way is really to quantitate uh, what the severity of the regurgitation is. I just had a question regarding um, mitral stenosis as a pressure versus flow limiting um, lesion and um, do, do you think that there's any bearing of the severity of the lesion on, on whether it could be flow limiting? I think we've all probably seen, uh, you know, particularly severe mitral stenosis with what seems to be a small underfilled left ventricle. Um, is there ever a point where it kind of overwhelms the ability of the left atrium to convey blood into the left ventricle, or is it? What are your thoughts on that? I mean. I yeah, I mean, you know, medicine is rarely black or white, you know, all one or all the other. But the concept is that, in general, I would say mitral stenosis is usually not a low flow condition in the way that we think of other low flow conditions. Um, remember, it, you know, all, most of our quantitation is based on gradient, pressure gradient. And if you had low flow, then you wouldn't have a pressure gradient. So if, you're, if your flow is consistently dropping as the orifice gets smaller, then why would your pressure be going up? Um, so you, you can't, you know, have it both ways. You can't say that it, the flow is low and then follow the pressure rising. So it generally is one or the other. Now, the extremes, sure. If you have, you know, a, a very small valve area of 0.8 or point even less, maybe at some point it's going to restrict your flow uh, a little bit. But in, in general, it's a dominant pressure problem. Much like aortic stenosis, same thing, right? Aortic stenosis by itself is not a low flow condition. Uh, it's a high pressure condition. Now, at a certain extreme, you can then have a consequence of LV hypertrophy, which gives you a smaller chamber size, or even EF reduction, which will affect your flow. 
But in a, you know, by itself, uh, stenotic lesions are not low flow conditions in general. All right, well, thank you all for tuning in, and uh, we'll see you back here again next week.